Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to So Very Wrong About Games. I'm your co-host, Mark Bigney, and with me, as always, is my loyal... Well, I once enthusiastically said he is a man whose presence I begrudgingly tolerate. Mike Walker. How are you doing, Walker? Fantastic, Mark. So I've been doing some listening to some other hobbyist podcasts in the interim, and I have to say I feel like I owe the listenership an apology, and to you as well. My understanding is that the canonical form of this kind of endeavor is one where we spend a solid 30 to 40 minutes every episode talking about what we ate last week, how we've been sleeping, uh, any ongoing home renovations we're undergoing. That's a big topic as well. And I feel like we've been depriving our listeners of this. Instead, you know, we've been getting out tight an hour and 10 minute episodes about games instead of yammering on about a whole bunch of non-game stuff. And, Don't and forget so- the, you know, the usual plugs of certain publishers and the, and the begging for the money. Yeah, and we haven't told our listeners about any mattress companies. I've all, I already feel guilty about this. It's, it, it's, it, I'm, I just feel bad. How are we going to make up for this? I have no idea. Give away games. Maybe. Or perhaps we could spend the entirety of one episode talking just about random aimless chit-chat. And that might, if we did that for like five consecutive weeks, we might be able to start True. making up the deficit. We could catch up. Okay. Well, at any rate, we're going to mix things up this week. This week, we're going to talk about board games. First, we're going to talk about games we played last week. Then we're going to talk about the news and why it doesn't matter. Our feature game this week is going to be Battle for Rakugan. And please send me all the emails about how I'm mispronouncing that made-up stupid word. And our topic this week is going to be gateway games. And very, if you were looking forward to the week where I was going to assert that the category that we were talking about doesn't exist... This is going to be your week. So Walker had his time to shine during the top ten. Uh, I'll have my moment to shine during the Gateway Games segment, but more on that later. I don't want to. I don't want to spoil anything. So with that in mind, let's talk about the games we played last week. Walker, what did you play last week? I'm going to start with Star Realms. It's an old sort of deck building game. I guess sort of need... deck building. Well, kind of almost. Kind of almost. All you do is deck build. <laughs> I guess it even goes right into that gateway thing. It's one of those things where you just lay out your hand. You don't need need to play your cards. You just lay it out. You generate your two pools, one of money, one of attack, and then you just apply it where necessary. Grab your cards. There's a there's a little bit of strategy there because there's a mechanism that they sort of put into this, and that's also in uh, Clank where they have the color matching. So we'll designate combos if you play two of a certain color. If you have one yellow out and you play a second yellow, then suddenly both the special powers of the yellow cards go off. So that's a pretty interesting mechanism. And we played nothing but the co-op. There's a co-op variant where you can fight a giant plant creature or fight uh, marauding pirates. And uh, yeah, it was great fun. It was good to bring it out again. I still enjoy it. It's not the greatest of all deck builders, but it's easy to remember, easy to play. Yeah, I'm a fan of the Realms games. I, I'm looking forward to the expansion for Fards of Infinity, which, sorry, Shards of Infinity. That was actually sincere that time. I, I For some reason in my head, it, it's Fards of Infinity. All the games put out by those guys at Stoneblade have been incredibly stripped-down deck builders, and I have to say, I would rather play a stripped-down game like that, where at least it's transparent that the only major decisions you're making about what to purchase, than some of the other ones that pretend to be a little bit more in-depth and where the, the hand structure is a little more cumbersome. But at the end of the day, you're just choosing what to buy anyway. So, Yeah, they're definitely milking it, right? There's so many add-ons for Star Realms. It made me remember like we've, these leaders were coming out, and they were just a bunch of nothing and the events that just bogged the game down. It just made me realize that it's one of these games where it's it's great at its core, and the more you add, it just sort of like... Their distribution model truly is interesting. They will, yes. sell, they will sell you a core game for 10 bucks that will su- that will accommodate two players. So if you want it to accommodate three or four players, which honestly is not the ideal configuration for a lot of the Realms, ga- Realms games, they haven't quite figured out multiplayer yet, you then have to pay all of 20 bucks. But then, if you want the mini expansions... You pay a usurious rate for some small number of irrelevant cards that might or might not come up anyway. It really is baffling to me. And that's one of the reasons why I prefer Shards of Infinity. They're not doing it that way. It's being distributed through Ultra Pro, of all people. And so they don't seem to have any plans for those those mini packs the way they did for Hero Realms, the way they did for Star Realms, the way they did for Epic. You know, I like some of their design work. And uh, it is it is it is indeed cheap and cheerful. And that is Star Realms. What did you play? I played Amun Ray the card game. This is this was put up by Reiner Knizia last year. And I went in expecting it to be very dry. And honestly, I didn't have high hopes, in part because among Knizia fans, I'm a bit of an outlier in that three of his very much appreciated by the, you know, the elitist Reiner Knizia uh, Cognoscenti, specifically modern art, Taj Mahal, and Amun Ray, I do not enjoy. 
Uh, I respect them more than I enjoy them. And so, uh, when I, but when I read the rules to Emin Ray, it looked like it might have stripped out some of the things that I didn't really care for and got it to a little bit pure. I was completely unprepared for how much I enjoyed Emin Ray the card game. I was also unprepared for how much everyone else enjoyed it. Because for me to appreciate a relatively dry Knizia auction game, that's no great surprise. But when everyone else around the table seemed to be, at the very least, mildly appreciative of the experience, that was that was really impressive. It's not perfect. As I say, it's a bit dry, and it's got some seating order problems, like many auction games do, and like many other t- kinds of games do. I benefited tremendously from sitting to the left of the immortal boy God King. I'll praise the immortal God King. And I didn't have to worry about turn order as a result. I was always second, and that was that 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 benefited me to no small extent. But I mean, it was it was it was really neat. It was a function of a really clever auction mechanism interacting with multi-use cards, interacting with a plurality of different goals that you might be pursuing, interacting with yet another auction mechanism, which in turn pegged your income. So as far as the, the, the money management went, it was really all integrated very well. It had a number of the recognizable bits from Amun Ray, but it, as I say, it stripped out a lot of the stuff and made things a lot more straightforward. Money was super, super tight, which is not something I normally appreciate in an auction game, for, but I think it worked in Amun Ray the card game. Anyway, I'm very much looking forward to playing it some more. It was quick. It was it was approachable. It was very enjoyable. And uh, I think, I, you know, I'm going to go on a limb here. This may be controversial. I think that Reiner Knizia knows how to do auction games. I think he's made one or two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was Amun Ray the card game. I got to play Endeavor. The Kickstarters all showed up, and I had never played it before. And it is a game where you're trying to get a lot of workers out so you can do more actions, but you need to get money in order to get the workers back and to clear those action spaces. And you also need to get bricks in order to build more buildings, which let you do more actions. So you sort of have to, like, balance out your actions and decide, you know, what to go into. And there's a cool area control mechanism going on where you're sending ships out to control harbors, to open up new areas. Overall, I thought it was a great game, and I'm looking forward to playing it again. The components of this new Kickstarter edition are pretty pretty nice, except for the player boards. So it was, like, their first experience with these you know, inlaid boards. And when you do inlaid boards, you have to make the base much thicker because you're gluing on a sheet that has holes in it and it's going to shrink. And therefore, if you don't make the bottom thicker, it's just going to make a rocking chair. So the player boards were ridiculously warped. But other than that, I had a great play of Endeavor. I was actually somewhat surprised when Endeavor got reprinted to the level of fanfare that it did. Because I remember Endeavor as being a, you know, slightly above average... Euro management type experience, but uh, people really seem to be liking it in the, 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 the next incarnation. I've looked over the second edition rules changes. I haven't played with the second edition rules, but they're all back portable to the first edition with the exception of the new boards that you commented that you weren't a terribly big fan of, of, of the new boards, but it's they're, they're, they're getting some appreciation. And yes, the new components are absolutely gorgeous, even if at times they are not 100% functional. I do, however, object to uh, the game trays with that obnoxious Z because even looking over the ones for Endeavor, it really does seem like the company. We talked about this before when talking about blinging games and t- custom inserts and all that. When I, when I whenever I look at a game trays product, I usually have a couple of moments when thinking, "Why did they make it that way? That doesn't seem like the most functional way to organize the components." People, I know that there was a, a number of comments to that effect when people looked at what they were doing with Eclipse that. You know, there was dozens and dozens of fan-made versions of Eclipse components that were vastly more functional than whatever Game Trays was working on. But it is a very visually appealing package, the new Endeavor, I have to admit. We played a couple games of Ordis Regni. Ordis Regni is a game that Walker adores. You played Ordis Regni. I was tortured by some crazed waterboarding maniac into some terrible game of terribleness. Okay, first of all, you requested it. I did. I think somehow, <laughs> like childbirth... Push the memory out of my head of how painful it was. Okay. Are you referring to when you gave birth or when you were born? <laughs> I'm con- anyway, um, 
here's here's the thing about Ordis Regni. I've, I've commented a number of times about this in the past. Ordis Regni is a ridiculously involved, wide open deck construction game that has fifteen different multi use cards with no text whatsoever. And at the beginning of the game, you're told build your deck of twenty four cards however you want. The only restriction is you can't have more than six copies of a given card, but you probably wouldn't want more than six copies of of, of any single card anyway. And there's a bunch of different ways to construct a deck, and it's super super approachable on that level. The game itself is not very approachable. There's lots and lots of intricacies. And one of the problems with Ordis Regni is it's one of those games where if you don't know how to carefully craft what you're doing, the vicissitudes of fate are going to smack you in the face so hard you'll be seeing double for weeks. And that, I think, is more or less what happened with Walker. Although, let, let, let me not put too many words in here, but what is it that you objected to when no, playing no, Ordis like Regni? I said, I think the mechanisms are great. The game itself... I don't have any huge objections to the whole thing. It's just I really feel that once you get behind, then you are very behind, and it's very difficult to make your way back. So in particular, what happens is I think the most the most arbitrary elements of the game, at least on the face of it, aren't so much you know drawing from your random deck or whatever, but it's who the Vikings are going to attack and what is going to happen as a result of a battle. There's this battle re- resolution mechanism where most of the time it resolves as normal, but in a minority of the time, it's absolute catastrophe for one of the two players if you are pursuing a certain strategy. And so it's at this point that I would put on my order striking snob hat and say, well, you know, you have to know that this is, this is the case. And if you're pursuing the kind of strategy that is vulnerable to an adverse battle result, you have to be careful and you have to know that you every attack carries with it this risk or every defense you launch carries with it this risk and you have to be able to plan for a fallow period to rebuild or to pursue a different strategy. This, of course, is not particularly satisfying to the person who you've just pants. Uh, but nonetheless, as a critic, I feel it's my obligation to point all these things out. I will not be playing again. <sighs> it's a shame. It's a shame. <laughs> I am going to talk about my Imperial Assault campaign again, only because it just the some of the things that came up, it's much like the old Ultima games. When you start an uh, old computer Ultima game, for those people that are old as dirt like I am, it went through a series of questions that me as a teenager at the time, I thought, were fantastic, uh, like to judge your character and through these like 15 very interesting questions, they would, they would come up with whatever alignment that you were going to be for the game and Imperial Assault are coming up with these questions as well. Like after you've done a mission, it'll give you like two options. It's like, I would, I don't want to give away any spoilers here, but you know, something happens, it's really terrible and you could, you know, give this person these things, but then this person's going to find out and these other people will die because of it. So these very unique and hard to dis- distinguish questions of which way to go because they're both terrible and yet both have, you know, good or bad consequences. And I think they did a really fantastic story writing job in this new campaign. And that is Imperial Assault, Jabba's Realm. I'm glad you're enjoying it. I tried Pandemic, Reign of Cthulhu. Now, normally I'm somewhat skeptical of rethemes of this nature, but all the Pandemic games that I've played thus far, with the possible exception of Pandemic Legacy Season 2, have been, uh, well, and with Pandemic Legacy Season 1, honestly, have offered some relatively interesting variations on the theme. I really liked the Iberian one. I liked the Dutch one. I'm looking forward to the Rome one. I've liked all the Pandemic expansions. But I have to say that Pandemic Reign with Cthulhu was reasonably disappointing for two reasons. Number one, the variance in terms of the effects was was all over the map. There was this element whereby when something bad happens, a new great old one gets revealed. And I thought that this was just going to be a straight analog of one of my favorite elements of On the Brink, namely the virulent strain cards, where every epidemic introduces a new aspect to one of the diseases that makes it more difficult to fight or more difficult to cure or, or what have you. And all of them, although unpleasant, are roughly within the same scale of difficulty. But the pandemic Reign of Thulu Great Old Ones range in difficulty from, oh, well, that's mildly inconvenient to, oh, well, I guess we're not going to win anymore, all with the the flip of a card. And that was rather unsatisfying there was there were there was one one occasion in particular one card uh, yig in, in specific that says all all the diseases need one more card to cure so instead of needing five you need six well given that your hand size is seven and given that there's only a small number of those cards anyway and you only do, draw two cards a turn and trading them is uh, is onerous well then getting from five to six is is an it's not just a difficulty in degree, it's a difficulty in kind. Anyway, we were not fans. Uh, it also made a number of changes to the economy of how it figures into the board and the resulting loss conditions. And it's either the case that the designers didn't realize or didn't care that that 
caused the both the difficulty and the arbitrariness to spike. And I am willing to tolerate one or the other, but not both, quite frankly. And so all of those things together, I thought, uh, you know, Pandemic is a very clean, very tight, very interesting design. And uh, up, up till now, I've just been lucky in that most of the fiddling has been done with uh, a steady hand. But as was evident in particularly in Pandemic Legacy Season 2, sometimes when you fiddle with it and you don't know what you're doing, you end up messing around with some of the central virtues. And I felt that Pandemic Reign of Clue was I, – I should have been expecting a disappointing reskin or retheme because that is basically what I got. So I still enjoy Pandemic. I'll still try almost any new Pandemic when it comes out, but I definitely am not going to be clamoring to try Reign of Cthulhu again. All right. My last game I'm going to talk about is just Mage Knight. We pulled Mage Knight out to take a play a quick game. That's air quotes, quick game <laughs> of in Mage Knight, and I'm I'm finding not that you know it's my you know rating of it's going down or anything, but I think I think there was more. I wish there was more difference in the characters because really initially their decks are all the same, and you don't level up fast enough to get those skills. That is what differenti- differentiates the characters from each other. Right, it's every other level that you go up, you get one of these skills, and I just wish that. And you're, if you want to pursue a certain strategy, you you really can't. You're more like at the whim of whatever skills are happening to come up in the offer. Like there's other strategies you can do, like you know, oh, I'm going to fight, you know, castles instead of wizards towers, or you know, how you manipulate the map. You can pursue different strategies that way. But as to building your deck, you're kind of hemmed in from the beginning, sort of. Uh, at the whims of, you know, the, the the offer. But still a great experience, as usual, with Mage Knight. I find the thing with Mage Knight is that it, the onus is on the player to really craft a hand and, in turn, and, and, as a result, an entire turn strategy on those advanced skill cards. If you... Or a spell. Either one. If you play an advanced card, well, certainly if you play it sideways, just for a generic effect, or if you don't really use it to uh, fundamentally change the scope of your turn, it's probably a missed opportunity. And yeah, that tends to, to feed into the feeling of, of genericness. And I agree with you. I, I, you know, all things being cool, I probably would have appreciated a little bit if the different characters had, had different little uh, more flavor than they currently do, because they have you know two different cards in their deck when you have the expansion and the skills. In fact, I think you're actually overselling it because you can actually take the skills of other players uh, over the course of the game. So, you know, yeah, Goldix can fly because he's a dragon and he's got wings, but if he doesn't take that skill, well, anyone can grow wings and fly. But, you know, they built it that way for a reason. You're supposed to be some sort of crazed, semi-immortal badass wandering around killing things for no particularly discernible reason, and they wanted to give you as much latitude as possible. And I do appreciate that. You know, the onus is, as I say, the onus is on you to build the combos, but I hear where you're coming from very much. How long did it last? Oh, we played uh, one full day, I think, by the time people showed up and kicked kicked us off the table. Oh, really? How long was that? Oh, how, well, how long did it take you to take the full day? About an hour. Oh, okay. Well, that's not so bad. No, no. Like I said, they, we both knew how to play, and it set up. When people know what you know how to play, it's quickly set up and yeah, and 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 started. I got to play a game of Race for the Galaxy, The Brink of War, which was the third expansion to the base game of the original set of expansions. I've commented before that my favorite way to play Race for the Galaxy is with The Brink of War, with goals, with prestige, without takeovers. I think in that sense, I'm, I'm pretty much with the mainstream on that, with the possible exception that a lot of people get rid of the goals. Some people get rid of prestige as well, and nobody that I know plays with takeovers because takeovers are the spawn of the devil. I had a great time. Game lasted 15, 20 minutes. It was a fabulous uh, tableau builder, had lots of tough trade-offs about what cards to use to spend, what cards to build, how to build them, when to build them, issues of tempo, what powers to trigger, all those other things. It really is a triumph in terms of the amount of time, and it, it's been too long since I played it. And I commented before that it's in my top ten games, and so uh, given that I haven't played it in a few months, it was a very, very, very welcome return to form with the Brink of War. I'm probably going to make, over the course of the next few weeks, a push to try to introduce it to other players. Not the version with the Brink of War, but maybe with Xeno Invasion, because Xeno Invasion is better with uh, more players as opposed to most versions, which is better than fewer. And because I might be able to get some traction around here because I get to pretend that it's a game with fighting, even though it's not really. So we'll see how that works. So that's Race for the Galaxy. 
And now on to the news and why it doesn't matter. The first bit of news I have is that by the time you're listening to this, in all likelihood, the Street Masters Aftershock Kickstarter will be live. They at Blacklist Games are putting out a couple of expansions to Street Masters. You can get all the original stuff if you want, or you can get uh, just the expansions. Like many Kickstarters of recent memory, they are going to be also having a box to hold everything. So I look forward to it being delayed a couple of years as the engineering problems get sorted out. There have been a number of issues about the pricing of the new expansions. They're going to be charging 109 bucks for a couple of expansions, which is rather a pretty penny. The response on the part of the Saddlers, somewhat defensively, I'd point out, not as a criticism, just, you know, not not the best PR marketing strategy, is, well, once all the stretch goals get unleashed, it's a tremendous value. Well, that may or may not be the case, but I've seen a number of Kickstarters fail because they priced something with the expectation that after the stretch goals get released, it'll be a good value. So we'll see whether or not that works. And it's also the case that on the same Kickstarter, for the same cost, namely 109 bucks, instead of two expansions in a box, you can get the base game, two expansions, and a whole bunch of other stretch goals on top of all that. So it's... Whether it's a good value proposition is up to you. I will be pledging because, as we've made clear in the past, we're big fans of Street Masters, and I am a sucker for the big box. It's I cannot lie. And um, one last coda, though, to, to all this, uh, for as far as Blacklist Games being a, a, a new fledgling company, I had missing parts in my base pledge of Street Masters, and I issued a request for replacements on July the 5th, and they arrived on October 12th. So the turnaround time could uh, use a bit of work. <laughs> and I mention this not just because I think it's relevant, but I also just want to make clear that despite the fact that I'm pledging, uh, I have some misgivings about their continued success as a company. So we'll see. Hopefully there will be better times ahead and they'll get all that smoothed out. But that is the uh, oncoming Kickstarter for Street Masters Aftershock. All right. My only bit of news, Essen is in the air because this is weekend of Essen. So all sorts of games being released, all sorts of gaming information out there, none of which I found was interesting to me, at least personally. But one thing I saw when I was looking through stuff was Carcassonne Safari. I'm a, I'm a sucker for Carcassonne. Not that I play an awful lot, but I like how they, you know, have the space game and how they change it up with, you know, different themes and stuff. And I know there's another you know, offshoot group that they play it on their lunch all the time. They play the Gold Rush one, all the different Carcassones, and they love everyone, so I'm sure they're going to be Amazon, all the rest of them. So they're going to be uh, very happy that there's going to be another Carcassone coming out. I've never heard you mention Carcassone before. I didn't know you were an enthusiast. I know, I I have the big box. Like I said, we just don't play it that much. I I don't know why. It's just because, I don't know, Any it's tile lane. I love tile lane games. Tile lane is, is fun. Yeah. You know what we should try? We should try Tigers and Euphrates. Uh, On that topic, uh, I got a rather unfortunate bit of news. Uh, There's the possibility that Grail Games, they who recently published Yellow and Yangtze and recently republished Stevenson's Rocket, uh, it is possible that they are going under, in part because of fulfillment issues related to the latter, latterly mentioned game, Stevenson's Rocket. This is always vaguely disappointing to hear that people weren't able to get fulfillment straight on a Kickstarter in a way that is financially ruinous. Having just complained about the way that you know replacement parts were handled uh, in Blacklist, I can certainly understand. You know, this is this I think. I mentioned this primarily because this is one of those consequences of the Kickstarter culture in, in which we operate. It's not enough that everyone can be a, a one-person publishing house. They also have to be a one-person fulfillment operation, whether or not they have someone else help them or on the back end or whether they use someone like Ship Naked or anyone else uh, more reputable. They ultimately are on the hook for shipping a, some small number of product, but to the four corners of the globe. And if some post office in Brazil swallows up a package, they're the one left. Hang- uh, they're the one left hanging. And in this case, it, from what I gather, not to get into too much of the detail, what caused the problem was some issue with fulfillment in Australia, which is often an outlying problem for a lot of game fulfillment. So it's it, it's sad. I miss you know the good old days when something would be published in Germany and we'd hear about it and. Maybe three months later, Rio Grande would deign to tell us they were going to be publishing in another six. And then eventually we'd get it. In the interim, we'd, you know, have to wait or or play with pay stops. But now everybody's got to be a fulfillment center. And uh, sometimes there are casualties. And Grail Games might very well end up being one of them. It is unfortunate. And now, our feature game, Battle for Rakugan. So is that how you say it? Sure, why not? I honestly, here's the thing. I normally pride myself in doing some degree of research. 
but largely due to the uh, flack that some of our more pedantic and misinformed viewers have been directing against us, I could not be bothered to find out the correct pronunciation, if there is a quote-unquote correct pronunciation of Rakugan. I mean, anyway... Moving on. So this is a game set in the Legend of the Five Rings universe. Which I know tons about. Like, I'm, I am the, no, no, I'm not. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know a whole heck of a lot about it either. It was originally uh, a CCG. Now it's been resurrected by Fantasy Flight as an LCG. I don't. There was a role-playing system. There's a role-playing system. There was a miniature game. There was briefly a miniature game. Uh, Obviously, I don't have a whole lot of experience with the system. I don't really care. To be quite frank, uh, I've never really found pseudo-mystical alternate history feudal Japan particularly engaging, so I've never really checked out any of the other Legend of the Five Rings stuff. But Legend of the Five Rings, uh, but Battle for Rakugan was designed by Molly Glover and Tom Jolly. Tom Jolly's uh, been in the industry for a long time, and a lot of his designs are a little more wacky. It's this he he often designs uh, his designs are often characterized by a strange combination of procedurally plotting and vaguely zany and wacky, which is seems calculated to alienate people like me in the, to the maximum extent. And uh, Molly Glover uh, doesn't really have much of a, of a publishing history. And as I've commented before, I'm very eager to try games published by this small number of hobbyist designers who are women. And, and so I, that was one of the reasons why I decided to, to check out Battle for Rakugan, and that's a bit of the pedigree. It was put out last year by Fantasy Flight in an uncharacteristically tiny box with understated components. So, Walker, why don't you tell us in your or characteristically unhelpful way what one does in Battle for Rakugan. That hurt, Mark. Unhelpful. I don't know about it. Anyway, in Battle for Rakugan, you're mostly just bluffing. You're bluffing. You're trying to control what your opponents are doing. You're trying to make them second guess every single move they make. Now, none of that makes sense because you don't know how the game actually works. In Battle for Rakugan, you're going to be placing, throughout the course of the whole game, you're going to be placing 25 tokens, five tokens over five turns. And your clan has, and every player has 27 tokens to deal with. So there's going to be two of your tokens that you're not going to play. So you need to decide the importance of the order in which you're going to place those tokens out on the board, because you're going to want to threaten some areas at the very beginning to try to make your opponents not place any tokens there. You're going to want to make sure you have dominance somewhere so they don't even want to bother putting tokens there or or bluff them into their own territory so they spend their time placing defense token there t- tokens there. More on all this later. That is Battle for Rakugan in my mind. Can I start with a, a minor complaint that you will probably have zero sympathy for and will probably get me some hate mail? I'm a little bit tired of every time somebody has a game design that involves warfare and treachery, it invariably is set in some sort of pseudo-feudal Japan. Immediately when people think of militarism and lying and backstabbing, they're like, oh yeah, Japan. Which, quite frankly, I find a little bit lazy and a little bit racist because... Every feudal system has had lots of warfare and lots of deceit and lots of treachery and lots of backstabbing. It's just in the in the hobbyist game space, it almost invariably makes a straight beeline into the in, into a Japanese setting. True, they had thousands of years of it with 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 thou- with hundreds of different ho- houses and territories and and there's a lot of history there. Yeah, but in the sort of quote unquote Western canon, if you start with say. The, even the Greek golden age of Pericles all the way through. It's just a series of a whole bunch of guys turning on each other, whether it's the Greek city-states, whether it's the Romans, whether it's the European feudal lords, whether it's the Holy Roman Empire, whether it's any of these things. Like, there's any number of settings that you could set situate these things in. Look, this isn't as bad as Manitoba, right? This is not the same kind of thing. But it, it, I do find it a little bit tiresome. But Japan did it in style. <laughs> All right, anyway, so I'd like to start off by talking about uh, what Battle for Rakugan cuts out. And these are things that I really, really appreciate. I'm not not saying that every battle game should uh, approach it this way, but this differs from a dudes on a map game in that there's no infrastructure whatsoever. There are no standing armies whatsoever. There's no dudes on this map. Everything is purely transactional, as you say, because it's all about placing these order tokens. Armies are order tokens. There's no differentiation between the army and the thing that moves it. So you're not taking move actions with armies on the map. It's all part of a single tile placement. And that cl- that that cleanliness, I really appreciate. 
And once you finish that turn, all of those tokens are removed. So every turn, you're placing new tokens out on the map. So there's no build-up, there's no real turtling, there's no, you know, this crazy build-up over time where people could just, you know, hang on, you know, wait for a certain turn and then unload everything. So to compare this to even Fantasy Flight's other big hidden order game, namely Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones is characterized, whether you love it or hate it, by a large amount of buildup, by a large amount of infrastructure maintenance, right? Because not only do you have to recruit your units at varying times because of this stupid bloody Westeros decks. Anyway, sorry, 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 I lapsed into it. Anyway. The fantastic Westeros decks. So you have to to levy these troops, you then have to be able to feed them, and then you have to start worrying about getting them around. In Battle for Rakugan, all of that is gone. It is just the tokens. And that doesn't... Initially, when I heard the principle, I didn't think that it was going to work. But in practice, it's actually quite lovely. And as you say, it completely gets rid of turtling. It completely gets rid of attritional fights. There's no notion of attritional anything. Everything is just more focused and sharpened, very much like a dagger to your eyeball. I can only agree with all of those points. Everyone has initially most of the same tokens and then every every player has a clan specific token and everyone has a bluff token and these are all mixed up at the beginning of the game and you're given you're given six a turn of which you're only going to play five and then every turn you have this wonderful wonderful bluff token available for you to play and why do you need this bluff token if you have enough tokens to play when I play them all? Well, because you might get a certainly powerful or a token that you know you're going to be able to use later. So you use the bluff token in order for you to hang on to that because you're just going to draw up to five, you know, up to five tokens on your next turn. So you play the bluff out so you can hang on to a token, oppose somebody or threaten somebody and they flip it over and it's the bluff token and they've wasted all of their resources in order to, you know, counter it counterdict this bluff token it's a fantastic feeling the other point that we should quickly cover as well is that you can play almost any of your tokens sort of as bluff tokens because there are restrictions of where you can put certain tokens but i shouldn't say there's restrictions of where you can put them it's when they're when everything's flipped up if there's a token where it's not supposed to be then it's just removed so tokens can be played anywhere much like the shinobi token but you can just play say i have a low level Army token, which doesn't make any, which I don't need this particular turn. Only shinobi tokens go directly into the province, so I can put this, you know, low-level army token directly down in someone's province. They think it's this, you know, raid token. They get all defensive. They do all these things to counteract it, and they've wasted their time. It's this is the part of the game that I think is is really fantastic. Part of me wishes, and this is. This isn't a fully formed thought of a variant, but part of me wishes that you were obliged to play your bluff every round. Because quite frankly, the opportunity cost of playing your bluff is rather considerable. Because as you say, you could just waste a token, uh, a a single strength army token, for example, which is probably not going to get you very far in most instances, except when it will. More on that in just half a second. But... I've generally found that whatever I would do with a bluff token, I could do better with an actual token that I'm using. And since you're not going to run out of tokens every turn you draw back up to your hand size of six, there's really a strong opportunity cost to playing your bluff. You're playing it instead of something that could theoretically be useful because sometimes the person that you're threatening with that bluff, if you were actually threatening them with a weak army instead, maybe they don't have the time to respond. Maybe they're not going to. Maybe they assume that that in the long run, they'd rather go get a a territory somewhere else. And maybe that's a good call or a bad call, maybe not. But uh, so I personally found that that people who play their bluffs aggressively, frequently it's it's a position of, well, you could have done better with with some other token. The only time when I found playing a bluff token to be uh, particularly useful is because you have an incredibly strong token that you want to save for for a, a later turn. And that's all well and good. But I just wish that the bluffs were a little bit more centrally integrated the game, into the game. Now, that having been said, I'm really, really terrible at this game. I r- I'm really bad at it, so maybe I'm just missing something. And maybe you can illuminate me no, as to why no, I should be playing the bluff I'm going I'm to come to the same, same conclusion, because like I've already said, that you have 27 tokens... And you're only going to be playing 25 of them. So every time you play it, so that means two of them are not going to be played at all. So you technically could lose your highest military token. You could lose your clan specific token. And every time you use that bluff token, you are increasing that pool of tokens that you're not going to get at the end of the game. So 
I'm on the same page is that if you can use one of, you know, your weak armies or, or tokens that you don't think you're going to use as that bluff instead, I think you're, you're crazy not to, because like I said, you're just increasing the pool of tokens that you're not going to see at the end of the game. So one thing that the game does give you is in Battle for a Coogan, everybody starts with three special cards, namely a couple of scouts and a Shugenja. And the Shugenja is a sort of a, a, a mystic who cancels one token of your choice. And so basically, as people are threatening you with these face down tokens, and again, whether they're bluffs or not, they could be of wildly varying efficiency. And so you have to start wondering, okay, I've got all these one shots. I've got three one shots that have to last me the entire game. I have to say, normally, when I start off with a small pool of one shots and I have to parcel them out the entire game, I wish that instead it were some sort of general use, weaker version of a power or something like that. But here, the economy of knowing when to use your scouts, I actually find to be one of the game's best tensions. Because you look at all the varying threats that are assailed against you on a given turn, and you start wondering whether this is the time to pop your scout. And I say this despite the fact that, as I said, I'm very bad at this game. I have an uncanny ability to use a scout on a bluff. I have scouted out bluffs more often than I've scouted out anything else, which I think means I deserve a medal of some kind. It's true. You've made the game so much more enjoyable for people when you flip over their bluffs. Maybe that's why everyone plays bluffs when I'm at the table, because they know that I'm going to play a (laughs) scout on it. Well, The only thing I feel is that those three cards, maybe people... They seem to be held on to the very end, I think, more often than not, and sort of like make the last turn sort of a wash because, you know, everyone's revealing, you know, these tokens, which knowing what they are really reduces the what the gist of the game is. So I'm wondering if if you somehow could only play one a turn or and that would stop you from holding them all to the end of the game. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. But I think that's a function of one of my biggest criticisms of Battle for a Coogan, and that is the scoring. In Battle for Kogan, you only score at the very end of the game. And you you score for the territories you hold. That is it. That is the only way that you're going to get points. It's the dirt that you're holding on to at the very end of the game. And I've commented before about dudes in a map games that all things being equal, I prefer it if the victory conditions are a little bit more subtle or if there are other ways to pursue points. That holding on to dirt as the be-all and end-all of military games or dudes on a map games is not my preferred version. And in Battle for Rakugan, what it does is it encourages this sort of end of the world mentality where pretty much the last round takes on this outsized importance and nothing else that happened previously is of, is of great consequence. Now, to a certain extent, that's fine. Games can and should build into a crescendo. But what that means is, is that the trivial little things that in other rounds might have evened out in a wash start taking on cataclysmic importance. For example, if it's during the fifth round that you happen to be the second player in seating order, which is by far the worst place to be sitting in Battle for a Coogan, or if this is the round where you happen to be picking a fight, you have to pick a fight with somebody to pursue your own objectives that sat on all their scout and Shugenja cards, or if it's the third round of... if this happens to be the round of the game when somebody desperately needs to make a push for a territory that you're holding on to by virtue of exogenous circumstances. All of these things can come together to make the last round or uh, rather unsatisfying and all the previous rounds somewhat unsatisfying. Have you had that experience? No, I agree with <laughs> I agree with what you said. It and it leads all like I said to the very last round always being this weird wishy-washy round which t- I think takes away from the game because the rest of the game is so good until you get to that final round where all hell breaks loose and craziness happens. And it's weird because the other special resources that you have access to, namely the region cards, if you conquer an entire region, you get access to another one-shot special power. Everything in this game is a one-shot. Nothing comes back to you. Everything is disposable. And to a certain extent, I appreciate that. But these region cards, you lose them the moment you lose any of the territories in the region. And since regions will swap back and forth between different players and it's more or less impossible to defend everything you have and it's probably not in your interest to defend everything you have you spend them more or less the instant you get them and that kind of deflates their sense of specialness it's like you just work towards this and then you just cash it in the moment you can and sometimes that just means that it's not going to be particularly interesting it also re- removes any sorts of, of, of cleverness of, or, or, or timing and so ultimately this kind of feeds into to sort of synthesize some of the other things I've said. When it comes to timing, I don't think that Battle for a Coogan is very good. So let me let me return back to this issue of turn order. Because it's the case that you're all just, all just placing these military orders, and they all get resolved at the end of the round, obviously 
with the very, very, very rare exceptions, playing last is to your advantage. Because that way you know what's going on, you can launch an attack against an undefended territory, or you can wait and see what the sum total of attacks against you are before defending, any number of those things. So on the one hand, Battle for a Coogan recognizes this and seeks to do something clever. It gives the start player a mild advantage. Namely, they can nuke someone one someone's token. Now, I say it's a mild advantage because... It is a mild advantage to them. The effect on the tar- the player it targets, though, is huge. It's a full fifth of their turn. It's 20% of the round. And it's one twenty-fifth of their entire game. The-, the order just gets removed from the board. It gets back into their pool so they can use it later. But whatever. As we said, you're not going to use them all. And so, ultimately, then, the turn dynamics I find desperately unsatisfying in the following way. As I say, being the second player is awful. Being directly to the left of of the start player is terrible because you have to commit before almost anybody else and you don't get any compensatory advantages. And more to the point, if you pick a fight with the start player, you're asking for trouble. So you probably don't want to pick a fight with the start player because they might nuke one of your orders. And so to prevent that risk, I find myself incentivized to play to the turn order and pick on the people that are earlier in turn order than me. I don't want to, I don't want to pick a fight with anyone on my left and I don't want to pick a fight with the start player. And I don't like it when game systems, especially turn order systems, direct my aggression in that way. True, but they do mix it up. I think this game does play best with five. And when it does play with five, everyone's going to get a chance to be the first player. And so you can sort of, you know, at least it's not, you know, there's no way to manipulate that. It's not as though you're going to be hit with second player twice or, you know, it'll be moved around a lot. Yes, but as you just said, the last round is vastly more consequential True. than the other round. Except rounds. for the last, yeah. So, so if, you're, if you're the start player in the first round and if you're the last player in the last round, you're golden. That's a huge advantage. It's true. And so it's, it, and, but yes, it is better with five than it is with four and three, because with four and three, the same player is going to be the start player more than once. And that is rough. That's true. And I want to do return to the, to the province cards. So, and each province has their own card and it's randomized between two different cards at the beginning of the game. But my, so my defense against that would be that fact that you could, once you get to know those cards, you can sort of time it out. It's like, okay, well, this is going to work. I know this, one of these cards could be there. So I'm going to take over this territory now, hopefully it's this card, which will allow me to play it right away. So maybe once you get to know the game better, maybe those province cards will get, you know, more useful. I think the game is a little too fluid for that. And I think that's both a, a positive and a negative. You're not really going to be able to count on holding any stretch of dirt you have for that long, I don't think. That 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 just seems like too much of a risk. Then again, as I say, I'm terrible at the game. Maybe, maybe if I were better at it and had half a brain to scrape together, I'd be able to see a couple turns ahead. But on that... On a similar topic of the cards and, and planning ahead, let's talk about the end game scoring cards. Because you get a whack of points for whatever territories you're holding, and you get a whack of points for uh, holding every territory in a region. Uh, but there's also, at the start of the game, you get a secret objective. And there's been a lot of discussion on Board Game Geek and elsewhere because many people, like myself, find this desperately unsatisfying because these conditions can range from the situationally borderline impossible to the borderline trivial. For example, everybody starts with the clan capital. Everybody starts with a region that is identified as the capital of their of their faction. And capitals, most of the time, are a little bit harder to take from other people. And as I say, you start off with it for free at the start of the game. So it's possible that at the start of the game, one of the secret objectives you're going to be dealt is hold that capital at the end of the game. And as I said, it's usually hard to look to look forward and see what, what stretch of dirt you have uh, a couple turns from now. But when it comes to one territory and a capital at that, you can probably hunker down and hold on to that sucker. Long story short, it's vastly easier if you get dealt your own cloud, clan capital capital as an endgame scoring card. And the reason why this takes on so so much importance is because the endgame scoring cards are the only element of hidden information with respect to the points. And as a result, you can end up in the situation, especially at the last round again, where you look at it and say, well, you know, all I have to do is take this region and it'll cost somebody six points, or I could take this region and it would cost them three. I can do a quick mental arithmetic about what scores to be. You know, maybe you you end up in a king-making situation, maybe not. Everyone starts whining at you about what what thing to take. And so the only element uh, to, to grist this mill because of the simplicity of the victory conditions, are these hidden cards, and they are so wildly varying in difficulty and quality based on faction. I find it a little unfortunate. The other problem with the capitals is that if they get attacked a lot, they become uh, more points. They become more valuable. Therefore, they become the target of the raid token. So then they burn, and then you have no chance of of getting your special 
ability, what's your special scoring card at the end anyway, because now it's been destroyed because you've made it a target, or it's just become a target, and it is a target right from the beginning anyway because it's a capital and it's worth more. Which dovetails with one of the very interesting elements of, of Battle for Rakugan, and this is neither necessarily a positive or a negative, and that is the overall feeling of the game, and that is that this is a very, very mean game. It's kind of like, in many ways, in terms of feel, it feels less like a traditional dudes in a map game, and it feels slightly more like a take that game, because Every command token you're playing pretty much, as I say, is take that, take that. I'm attacking you here. I'm punching you here, whatever. And I, it, it, it's therefore quite understandable that the most powerful tools at your disposal, these raid tokens that literally take a territory out of the game for the rest of the game and all associated benefits and bonuses and whatever fortifications it had, whatever attacks it was launching, whatever, they're all gone, all gone, just burned to the ground with a single token. The most powerful things you can do don't help you. They just hurt someone else. And most people have one raid token during the entire game. And you have to decide who you're going to kneecap real hard. And those are the kind of decisions you make in Battle for Rakugan. And as I say, that's neither necessarily a strength or a negative. It's just a, a feature of the game that a lot of other games of this ilk don't have. When you're playing a game like Kemet, when you're playing a game like Senji or Lords of Hellas or even Game of Thrones... Most of the time, your most powerful tools are for your benefit, not just to harm someone else. And it's a very striking element of the design. I think it's great. It's it, Because it's. I don't think it overstays its welcome. It's a very quick game. Once you get to know it, 25 tokens being placed, you can go through it fairly quickly. And it's one of those games where there's, you know, there is a little bit of negotiation, you know, where it's like, okay, don't attack me there. I won't attack you there. But in in reality, it's all you're doing is attacking. There's no, you know, worrying about, you know, building this capital over here or building this church or or defending your things. It's just attack, 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 and you don't have to worry about anything else, and the game is over, and overall, I think it's it, they've done a great job. I think it actually takes a little bit longer than it should. I agree with you. It's just 25 tokens that, 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 that you're popping out. But unsurprisingly, in games where there are lots of small transactional things, people just pause and take stock of the board and consider their options. And suddenly those 25 actions start to draw out. And so if you've got five players placing down 25 tokens, you might figure, oh, well, you know, it just takes 10 seconds per. We'll be done in no time. Eh, in practice, things don't tend to work that quickly. This is not a criticism about slow players. It's just sometimes games with lots and lots of small little turns, the time adds up quickly. So I find Battle for Coogan reliably to be a, to be 90 minutes, even with experienced players. True, but comparably to other games like that, due to the fact that you're putting down all your tokens face down, so there's little, there's less reaction time you know, to what people are playing, like you you have to react to them. The fact that they put down a token, but you don't know what it is. So you can't really math out every situation. So you're, I think in the fact that you just flip them all up at the end and then they resolve auto resolve by themselves. So I think that saves time as well. It does, but you have to consider, do I want to fight this front? Can I fight this front? Am I able to defend it well enough? Okay, well, look at my hand again. I've got this three army. Do I open up the three army here? Or do I want to open up another front somewhere else? What territories do I really want to do? Should I use my scout? Is this the time to use my scout? What about that territory card? Should I push for the territory card? So these are all the considerations that get you know rejiggered every time anyone ever plays a token. And as I said, these are these are interesting decisions, but it, it is the case that it does cause the, the game to move at a slightly more pedestrian pace than all things being cool I would prefer. I mean, very often we're talking, you know, our, our perennial favorite dudes on a map game is Kemet. And Kemet moves faster, I think, all told. Uh, your average game of Kemet, even with new players, I think gets done, uh, if not faster than Battle for Kugan, you know, certainly no slower. And there's there's more going on in a, in a game of Kemet. You don't have just this pared down uh, experience. I think the added detail is, you know, of interest, especially since it, it doesn't take a, a particularly onerous approach to things like infrastructure and, and things like uh, administrative overhead uh, compared to, say, Game of Thrones. So I'm not saying it's too long. That's not my criticism. I'm just saying that it often I often feel like it should be faster than it is, and it is actually a substantial game playing time, which is, you know, fine. All right. All being told, I think we both enjoy Battle for Coogan. In fact, that we got it quite a while ago and we've brought it back to the table several times and i think it will continually hit the table just i think it just plays very well in our particular group i literally only have one bad point and we've already talked about it the fact that you might get handicapped by losing your you know your unique token or your more powerful tokens at the end other than that i enjoy everything else about the game 
I'm very into the bluffing part of the game and, you know, strong talking tokens when you put them out type thing. It's like, you know, you know, you don't want to go against that token, you know, that's the one that's going to get you or, you know, I uh, finally decided to play my raid. You're not allowed to have that, you know, territory anymore. You know, that's, that's it. I'm sorry I had to do that to you, but it's really my bluff token or, you know, my two army. I, it's just a great part of the game. I have substantially more mixed feelings about Battle for Krugan, to be honest. There are just a number of problems that keep me from fully enjoying it. The biggest problem I have is with the scoring system. And I enjoy the process of the game. But whenever I start internalizing victory conditions and thinking about what's actually happening in terms of the score, my enthusiasm deflates considerably. When I start thinking too much about how turn order is affecting my decisions, my enthusiasm deflates conflict, uh, substantially. And ultimately, I think that when it comes to uh, dudes on a map games, it's not a dudes on a map game. When it comes to Hidden Orders games, I would much rather play Senji, another Plague for Senji, which is a brilliant, brilliant game that is sadly overlooked. It's also the sort of tired, sort of, you know, treacherous Japanese feudal lords uh, theme, but I think it does it a whole lot better. And if it's a question of playing a strict take that game, I'd much rather play something like Doer, uh, The Lesser Houses, uh, recently released by Jim Felly. It, it actually captures a, a number of the things that I think Battle for Akugan wants to do. They're very, very different games, both thematically and mechanically, but at the end of the day, it's about hidden motives, not really knowing what, why, what territories what someone wants for the end of the game. It's about punching people in the face repeatedly. Uh, it's about, you know, having your friends hate you but laughing all the while. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's simpler and the scoring is more nuanced, which I think is, is definitely a virtue. So I don't think it's... I, I certainly don't think it's a bad game and I think it's good and I've enjoyed my time with it. It's just my enthusiasm wanes with every subsequent play largely by virtue of these structural elements of scoring and turn structure. It is definitely worth experiencing though just to see what a dudes on a map game can be turned into. As a, as a design work, I think it's very interesting. As a play experience though, I think some of the design elements hold it back. I think it's been slightly overlooked too. I don't think it's got the buzz that it, it should have got. Fantasy Flight, when they put out smaller titles, when it's whether it's something like Blue Moon Legends, when it's something like Battle for Rakugan, they if they don't give it a big push, then it probably doesn't get a whole bunch of attention. It's yeah. as gamers, we are foolish, short sighted, no attention span, flame seeking idiots. Must always have the newest thing. Kickstarter jockeys. Absolutely. Sweet. And that was Battle for Rakugan. So our topic this week is going to be gateway games. Let me begin with a small rant. Very small. I promise I'll try to keep it to under 20 minutes. So the first thing I'd like to point out is, first of all, the term girlfriend game is quite thankfully dying out. People are now talking about significant other games or what have you. I hate the tame, uh, term girlfriend game. It implies that games are for men, and sometimes they want to share it with the little women folk. And can you please suggest to me a game that is sufficiently simple or friendly that my poor adult girlfriend will be able to comprehend it? Oh, I, I hate it. I hate it so much. I'm so thankful that that term is going away. The other thing that I find troubling, though, in the context of, of identifying something as a gateway game, and this this will elaborate more uh, as we talk about the topic, is it implies that it is a single thing. There's a single thing that can serve as a gateway game to show everything about what the hobby has to offer and is suited for everyone who might be vaguely curious as to what the hobby has to offer. And I think that both of those assumptions are fundamentally flawed. I mean, after all, just look at the absurdity of the situ uh, situation of assuming that there could be a single gateway game. We spend over an hour every week talking about lots of different games, lots of different kinds of games and their strengths and their weaknesses and the different kinds of experiences they engender. And then to try to boil all that down into a single game for somebody else is absurd. If somebody asks you, I've never seen a movie before, I'd like to see a movie, you don't start thinking, well, you know... There's only one kind of movie, or... Yeah, Ace Ventura. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Or video games. If somebody hasn't played video games on a console before, because almost everyone's played a video game in some context, but if nobody's played a console video game, it's like, well, what, what, what's a good intro game? It's like, well, uh, uh, what are you looking for? And so, so ultimately, that's, that's what I'm coming down to. When it comes to gateway games, I think one thing that people rarely ask is, what is it that you're looking for? What is it that the group of people to which you are trying to introduce games, what is it that they like? What is it that they like to do? Anyway, rant over. That being said, I do sort of have some points about that. It's like uh, some themes that they're interested in. Like if they have a hobby, say if they like quilting, you do patchwork, or they're in their figure skating or boating. Some sort of themed game that will keep them interested in, in the game. Or say if they already play some sort of game, like say if they play Bridge or Euchre. There are tons of other games, trick-taking games, that will that will 
have rules or mechanics that will that they will recognize and and it will make it interesting for them. I would issue a very minor. I agree with you entirely. I would issue a very minor caveat, and that is you should stress at the outset that whatever it is that you're showing to them that is similar is going to be vastly different. I've had a yeah. lot of I've had a lot of negative experiences, all all my fault, whereby someone says I really like Game X, and I say Oh, I can recommend Game Y. It's very similar. And then at the end of the game, they're like, Well, the thing I like about Game X is this one specific feature, and this game didn't have it, so I didn't like it. It's like, Well, you have to be careful about how you prime people for these experiences. Or if they play games with a a sci-fi theme or a pirate theme, you can bring in other games that have the same theme, and hopefully they'll enjoy those as well. Okay, let's talk specific games. Let's talk about the elephant in the room. First of all, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. Let's talk Catan. I don't know that we've ever talked about... Well, Catan is... I I don't even have that on my list. I know you don't, but look, Catan is often mentioned as a solid gateway game. But I thought gateway games were too have people enjoy games. Right. So <laughs> let's assume for the sake of argument, above and beyond the fact that neither of us really like standard Catan, I, there are a number of Catan games that I do enjoy. In jest. I played, I didn't have it in my games played, but I played Catan just a week ago with a group of people, and that's the only game they own. It's the only game they play, and I had a wonderful time playing it. They had a great time. They love it. I have no problem. They, they played just an open sort of rule set. And I thought it was fantastic. I have no problem with Catan, but it definitely wouldn't be a game that I would introduce anyone to at, at this back then for sure. Nowadays, not even close. Well, I find it strange that it's so often mentioned as a gateway game because there are two features about it, which I think, uh, to a certain extent, you might quibble with this these characterizations of the game if you're a big fan of, of, of Settlers of Catan, which I'm not. But for one thing, the game can stagnate a little bit. There are fallow periods where the necessary resource isn't entering the system, and so you just end up, anyone got any wheat? No, we didn't get any wheat. We're not getting any wheat for another couple turns, whatever. Uh, and that's not really... One of the things that I, I, I think is very important for a gateway game is that it move at a brisk pace, that everyone can keep going uh, relatively quickly. And another thing about Catan, which also undermines that, is that if you play quote-unquote properly, which many hardcore gamers seek to do, it can become very, very procedural. It's like, no, you can't do that now. You can't trade now. You have to wait for this thing to happen. No, 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 the build phase is over. You can't build now. Obviously, lots of people play fast and loose with that. And if you do that, then obviously it becomes a slightly more suited as a, as a gateway game. But it's just Catan is a game that is very often uh, a, a poor introduction to the hobby. And so I find it surprising that it that – I find its ubiquity as a suggestion surprising. Yeah, apparently, I've ruined Catan for many people because when people say, you know, they like Catan or they play Catan, and I said, well, you like rolling 2d6 because that's what you do when it's your turn, you roll 2d6. And then it's the next person's turn, they roll 2d6. And apparently when they've gone back to Catan, that's all they can think of. And they think that's all they're doing over and over is rolling 2d6 every turn. Walker, I hate to break it to you. You ruin a great many things in a great many ways. Sweet. It's my, it's my life. Did you know that moving left is not a game? You ruined podcasting, for example. It's hey, over it's, now. The, it's, media, it's... the medium's done. All right, so let's get on to some... Let's talk about some other let's, games, let's yeah. Let's talk about some real games. No, I shouldn't say that. It's 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 a fine game. Um, no, I, I would actually... I, I would disagree with you there. It's just, I, I think, regardless of its merits, as I say, it is particularly ill-suited as an intro game. True. And for its time, it was fantastic. Oh, sure. The one... The newer game that a lot of people tote as a big gateway game is King of Tokyo. That is true. Why is King of Tokyo good in my book? It's because there's very little... When it's your turn, there's little, very little choices. And there's a lot of games on here that's much like that. When it's your turn, you do one thing, and the game sort of plays itself. So in King of Tokyo, you you know, you know roll the dice. There's a little bit of decisions, you know, Yahtzee style, keep those, re-roll. So it's a mechanism some people are, are, are used to with Yahtzee, and it's giant monsters in a, in a downtown, suburban, destroying houses sort of theme. So children will get into that right away, and it's easy to learn. The other one that I think is often mentioned, and this is possibly the most commonly mentioned gateway game, is Ticket to Ride. And I'm not a huge fan of Ticket to Ride, but I think that you and I would probably both agree that a game that is very, very similar to it that I think might be a superior offering is Ethnos. Problem is, Ethnos is out of print. And it doesn't look like it's going to be reprinted anytime soon. I don't know if there's there's ever going to be uh, plans for a reprint. Uh, but it's hard to to recommend a, a, a game as a, a good general Euro gateway game if, you know, you can't go to the store and get it. And the availability of a lot of these other titles, like King of Tokyo, like Ticket to Ride, like even Catan, is certainly something in its favor. 
people like what's familiar, and if they haven't seen, if they've seen it on their store shelves, they might be more apt to think that it is something that they can uh, uh, that they can approach and play. But as you say, the 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 notion of your it makes it sound like we're, we're talking about how these games don't have choices. But if the turn structure is sufficiently pared down that on your turn you can only do a very small subset of things, it can really, really help you in terms of easing, easing non-gamers into a game. And Ethnos, all you can do is draw a card or play a set. That's it. Despite that, you get a, a, a pretty good nuance of choices there. And that's one of the reasons why I think Ethnos is one of my go-to gateway games. Now. True. And same thing with King of Tokyo. I don't mean like there's, there's no choices, but the choices you make don't have huge consequences in the future. Whereas something like in Gaia Project, you make the wrong move at the beginning or other Euro games. Uh, uh, why did you chain, think, why didn't you think of Gaia Project and Food Chain Magnet in the context of gateway games? No, I'm, well, I'm just saying, I'm, I'm just saying like as soon as you make a mistake early in those games, then you're done. Whereas these it, things like uh, King of Tokyo, choices that you make in a specific turn do not have long-standing consequences, is what I'm trying to say. Sure. Anyways, to go on about uh, gateway games. Co-op games are a fantastic way to bring people in because it's sort of, I don't want to say alpha gaming or quarterbacking, but it's an experience that everyone shares. Well, if, I agree with you, if it's the case that the person teaching the game is able to be responsive to the signals that the other players are giving out, you know, offering assistance when it's clear they want it, stepping back when it's appropriate for them not to to give assistance. If somebody only knows how to alpha game, or if only if someone only knows how to what I would say beta game, you know, if somebody a new player is like, uh, what should I do? And the only thing, you, the only way you normally respond is, well, you know, it's your turn, do whatever you want to. You know, both of those extremes can be very problematic. But yes. A sensitive game introduction, I think that many co-ops are excellent, excellent gateway games. So on the pandemic, I think, is a great one for that. It's uh, it's a great theme. It's something that everyone can get behind. There's pr- plenty of films out there that have that experience, and it's something people can relate to. Pandemic. And it really I, – I find that non-gamers often get very impressed – when they learn that there are, are cooperative games at all, because there are certain stereotypes about hardcore gamers, some of which are often true, and one of them is that we are very, very competitive, and what we want to do is lure unsuspecting people off the street into an experience so that we can ritualistically crush them. And I don't know how people found out about my Halloween plans, but definitely playing a co-op game is one way to undercut that, that perspective. I have code names on this list. I brought code names through multiple countries, and it was a hit everywhere. It's it's teaming up, it's wordplay, it's trying to be clever with with language, which is it, it, for some people is is a fantastic feeling to to come up with you know one word that's going to link in you know seven different words that are on the board to to make a connection with someone. I'm going real deep into code names for some reason, but anyway, to make that connection with someone that they that they inferred what you meant with just one word is a fantastic experience, and I think code names is by far one of the greatest games out there. It is an intensely social experience, and that is again another way, very much like co-ops, to ease the transition into what may be a relatively foreign experience for people. And they can vanish into a large group when need be. If if you're playing with a large enough group of people and, and they are not the code, don't make new players the code master unless they want to, obviously. But it's the the fact that it's constantly talking with people and communicating again. It, it steps away from the stereotype of, uh, of 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 gamers being these antisocial rejects and 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 just burying ourselves in complicated rule sets. I would say the resistance for many of the same reasons. Only if you're playing with people that enjoy logic puzzles, because it is a very intense social logic puzzle, but it is very, very, very uh, social in its nature. And you uh, you have to be a little conscientious about drawing people out, but the moment they start seeing the possibilities of the different combinations, things really do start to open up. And even for people who, I, even generally speaking, the people to whom I've introduced the resistance, even those who haven't enjoyed it, it does show a side of gaming that I think it can be very illuminating for lots of non-gamers. One also that I've always found and keep for... Uh for new players is is it to Ciro or Ciro? Ciro. Ciro. It's a great tile laying game. And it's one of those things where you don't have huge decisions. Like I said, you have three cards, you play one of them, you advance your dragon along this nice rope trail and you just try to you try to Tron style, I guess, keep on the board and try to eliminate other players. 
I think it's a, a great uh, opening game for sure. It, it's awfully pretty, but it's so trivial and it has player elimination. And I think that those two things, for me, a great gateway game has to give, has to be able to give a new player some inkling of what kind of strategic or tactical decision making is the bread and butter of the kind of Euros or Ameritrash or whatever, it, whatever type of ga- game it is that, that you play and or whatever other type of game you think they might be interested in trying later, if at all. True, but the games last so quick. I don't, I don't think player elimination is really a problem. It just more look, looks beautiful and shows them what, what is possible. I, I don't even think it shows them. I, I, that's just it. I don't think it shows them anything. I suppose. <laughs> I, th- I think it has some very interesting decisions once you get to see. You know, really? How, yeah. Okay. What do you have on your list? I've just been going through my games. What, what do you got? Pretty much any dexterity game, any good dexterity game, I think is a great way, again, to show new players that basically what we like to do is play with toys. Uh, junk art, I've had a lot of success with primarily because it is just... So obviously it's a very silly game, but the theme of the game is just pretentious enough that it's able to let people who don't want to think that they're playing with toys think that they're not just playing with toys. I don't know why. It's a mystery to me. But I've, I've, I've had more success with it than I thought I might because a lot of people, uh, you know, look down their nose at dexterity games, you know, whether they're, whether they're gamers or non-gamers. You know, there's lots of people who, who don't like them. We are obviously not these people. I wouldn't suggest something like Seal Team Flicks. Seal Team Flicks, the only game that matters, is not a good uh, introductory game. But something like Junk Art, something like Manara, uh, you know, a co-op dexterity games that, that, that ticks off both those, those uh, boxes. You know, I'm, uh, similarly, I wouldn't necessarily recommend something like Rhino Hero Super Battle because, again... I think you have to be sufficiently deep into the hobby to accept that you're going to be playing with kids' games and kids' toys to really get there. Uh, but something like Junk Art, I think, is is uh, definitely something that can oh, get started with. All right, let's talk about Blue Lagoon then. Do you have Blue Lagoon on your list? I don't, and here's why. I thought about Blue Lagoon. Blue Lagoon, the recent tiling uh, game from Reiner Knizia. The trick is Blue Lagoon is very, very simple and very approachable, but the scoring is a little bit tricksy. You know, there's a list of, of six or seven ways to score, and that, I think, knocks it out of the realm of good gateway game. I think it's still a very, very light gamer's game. And I'm not saying it's, it's, it would be a bad option for a gateway game, but I don't think it's definitely one of the, uh, the, the top-tier choices. I would instead suggest Through the Desert, can it see his other great tile laying game, because the scoring is simpler and because it, uh, it, it, it actually it's a more robust game, and it shows... It can show new ga- gamers how positional abstracts can be done in a multiplayer fashion because everyone's passingly familiar with chess. More and more people are passingly familiar with Go. But Through the Desert shows you how you can do relatively abstracted movement like that in a multiplayer context. And it also shows, I think this is also a very important thing to, to, to do again, of the idea of getting people accustomed to the notion of playing with toys. It, it can show you that positional abstracts can be cute because those pastel camels are adorable and everyone loves them. And when you see the fact that it's a very serious game but with very approachable rules and with those adorable components, I think that Through the Desert is honestly one of the very top-tier intro games. I've had a lot of success with it. I'm surprised it's not recommended more often. And I think it's a, it's a shame that it's not thought of more frequently in that context. Then there's games that are just look great and are fun to play, like tile lane games. I have down here Quadropolis and Between Two Cities. So there's something about just building a city, you know, having it, de- you know, develop and, you know, form up. Even if you're not doing well or doing it right, it's still fun to do. And then once you see the scoring, how the scoring works at the end, you can immediately play it again and get more out of it. Because both those games are relatively similar. Same things with uh, Same thing with Carcassonne. Carcassonne is not my favorite tile layer, but I still think it's a pretty good uh, gateway game. It was my gateway game for what it's worth. It was the first sort of hobbyist game that I played, and it's sufficiently visually appealing. And your choices on a turn, as you say, are sufficiently pared down, that the game moves at a good clip, assuming you play with small player counts. So I, th- I, I think it deserves its status as a, as a frequently mentioned gateway game. The the other gateway game that I have, other than Through the Desert, that I think is is strangely omitted is Antica 2. Now, this is not necessarily what I would suggest for everybody as, as a gateway game, but it does have all those features that we've mentioned. It moves at a good clip. Your choices on a turn are relatively pared down. You know, the rondel restricts what actions you can take. So if somebody's already accustomed to, say, lots of games like Risk, or they played lots of Civilization on the PC... 
uh, or are familiar with things like that. And you, they are very clearly interested in something that's a little bit meatier than a lot of these other games. Uh, I've introduced Antica and Antica 2 to people who don't have extensive hobbyist experience, despite the fact that it is a no-luck, relatively deeply strategic game. It is so satisfying and smooth and accessible that I think it really can be an effective gateway for certain classes of gamers. Again, to call back to something we said at the beginning, you have to be sensitive to what it is that people are looking for, to the kind of experiences that they're looking for and what what they might uh, appeal to them in terms of theme and mechanics. But Antica 2, I I think, is an overlooked uh, uh, gateway game into people who are kind of civ heads. True. What mechanism or what what it does have that I just realized is another good thing is slow buildup. So games that have a slow buildup are probably a great gateway game as well because they can slowly see what's happening and then tr- transition, hopefully, if they're understanding what's going on, transition in and actually do well in the game. I'd say gradual rather than slow because if it's if it's too slow, they're going to lose no. interest. Oh, I, 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 gradual. Yeah. Sorry, gradual. Yeah, yeah I agree. Uh, what's the other ones I want to talk about? There's another set of games that I think are fantastic. It's Karuba and To the Limit. I think those are two very good gateway games as well because everyone is – you know that you call it one number. Everyone uses the same piece, but they're all building their sa- their own board, and it's very interesting to watch how everyone else develops their board differently, or they can follow along and see. You know, because everyone's doing the same thing, they can sort of just follow along and understand the, how the game works because everyone's doing the sort of same thing at the same time. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I really think that to return back to what we said at the beginning, there's no one exemplar of what a, a good gateway game is. You have to try to be sensitive to what people are looking for, whether it's a thematic hook, whether it's a mechanical hook because it's similar to a game they've played before or what have you. And this isn't even touching – we've kind of alluded to this – the vast range of skills that are necessary to successfully introduce a gateway game to people who are are interested in games. I mean – Part of the problem is is that most people take a look at a huge game collection like you or I have and they immediately assume that there's no there's no room for them in that world. And overcoming that is a topic unto itself and a, and a, and a huge issue. But as we say, we've had a number of – we've had a fair degree of success with some of these games and a lot of the conventional wisdom I think is misguided. I mean I'm, as I say, I don't think Catan is a good gateway game. I think that through – uh, I think Ticket to Ride is not a particularly good – a good game to introduce people to the hobby to. I think that games like Through the Desert are, and uh, is, is, is tragically overlooked as a good way to to access people into the hobby. And uh, but then again, sometimes the conventional wisdom is is bang on. Pandemic we th- we both think is a very good intro game. Code Names is often mentioned as a great social experience. Pretty much any party game. And I think it's a bit of a shame that people don't think of dexterity games more often when people think of intro games. True. My only thing to add is, like, know your crowd, like you've already said, and don't force it. If you, you know... Oh, dear Lord, no. If you feel as though, you know, the table's not feeling it, then don't don't keep pushing. Yeah, and this... Th- something we should have mentioned at the outset. This is assuming that the person actually... This person who's not a gamer actually wants to be introduced to hobby games. Because let me tell you, 99 times out of 100, they don't. And so <laughs> unless they bring it up, possibly even... My, my general rule is I wait for someone to bring it up twice on their own. Uh, because if they just say, oh, you, you know, these games look interesting. Maybe I'd like to try one sometime. That's not enough. I wait for yeah. them to mention it again. Exactly. They have to <laughs> specifically say, hey, you said something about playing games. When are we going to do that? Right. Then you know, then it's time. Right, right. Before that, definitely not. Because it doesn't matter what game it is. It doesn't matter if it could theoretically be their favorite game. No one is going to like a game when it's forced on them. So that's going to wrap us up for this episode of So Very Wrong About Games. Thank you very much for joining us. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can reach Walker via his email, justrolledadice at gmail.com. You can reach me, Mark Bigney, on Twitter at the games you like. For more public discussion, you can find the So Very Wrong About Games Facebook page, or you can check out our Board Game Geek Guild, which is guild number 3236. We read everything you send us, and we will get back to you if we possibly can. Thanks once again for tuning in, and we hope to see you again soon. Take care, everyone. Peace! You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bigney. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time, and always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong.